Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the final webinar in our fall 2023 series presented by Newton Conservators. My name is Beth Wilkinson, and I'm the moderator of this virtual event. Nissa Patton is our technical director tonight. As most of you know, Newton Conservators is an all volunteer nonprofit established in 1961 that connects people to open space and that works to preserve and maintain open space in Newton. We are grateful for the beauty and sustenance that the land provides for humans and the other creatures with whom we share the earth. We acknowledge the Massachusetts stewardship of this land that kept its ecological communities vibrant, strong, and interconnected for thousands of years. And we hope to work with them as we strive to maintain and restore our open spaces. Tonight's presenter is our own Barbara Bates, who will teach us about the habits and natural and cultural history of turkeys, including pecking order and how they survive so well in our cities. For more than 16 years, Barbara Bates was a teacher naturalist for Mass Audubon's Habitat Education Center and Wildlife Sanctuary in Belmont. Barbara has retired several times, first from a long career in the high-tech world, and more recently from teaching as an adjunct faculty member at Northeastern University. As we all will see, she loves all things nature. We're really fortunate to have her here tonight to share her knowledge and her wonderful photos with us. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you, Beth. I'm gonna start my screen sharing here. And I wanna introduce you to my backyard. Actually, this is my neighbor's backyard. Uh, they have a large Roxbury pudding stone outcropping. And this is a flock of uh, poults, the small turkeys, and the hen, the large turkey in the center, decimating her garden, looking for, for bugs. What I'm gonna do tonight is really share with you the biology of turkeys, uh, their prevalence, the cultural history of them, and even how to hunt them. So with that in mind, I am going to do a little sound for you. This funny purring sound is a sound that those little poults were making, just calling to each other, telling their mom that everything is fine, it's all copacetic, I'm a happy turkey, things are good. And the thing to remember about turkeys is that they weren't so common long ago. If they had been in 1941, when Massachusetts chose the black-capped chickadee as their state bird, if they'd been common then, there's a good chance that the turkey would have been the state bird. Instead, after they were reintroduced to Massachusetts, they became the emblem of the game bird. So what's in the name? What Everybody wonders, how do they get called turkey. Turkey is in central, is in uh, the Middle East. And here we are in the North, North American area. And why are they called turkeys? Well, it goes back to a common thing that arose in the Middle Ages when anything that was the remotely bit, even the remotest bit uh, exotic was called turkey. Uh, whether it was an animal or a spice or anything else, it was called turkey because exotic things came from turkey. So you had things like the, the guinea hen up here being called turkeys. You had things like the peacock being called turkey cocks. And of course, you had the American turkeys being called turkeys as well. Now, you may wonder why the national bird is an eagle and not a turkey. There was a battle. It wasn't actually for the national bird. It was for the bird on the order of Cincinnatus. And there is reputed, and we in fact have it on paper, that our own Benjamin Franklin called the eagle a bird of bad moral character. Eagles are, are, are stealers. They steal roadkill, they steal prey, they're fish eaters. Uh, so he called them a bird of bad moral character. Whereas turkeys will attack, especially male turkeys, will attack things that are red. And he thought that the eagle uh, 
had no courage compared to a turkey who would, in his words, attack a grenadier. So he was all for the turkey. Let's go back and see how turkeys evolved in North America. We know from remains back, dating back to 800 before the Common Era, we know that turkeys were domesticated uh, in the south central Mexico area where the, where the Aztec uh, people lived. They had domesticated the turkeys and there were quite a few of them. We know that by 200 years before the Common Era, those turkeys had been, those domesticated turkeys had become common in the US Southwest, lots of them all over the place. And that reach extended by the 1500s to New England with some possibly 10 million turkeys running around New England. We know that the Aztecs used turkeys to make capes as well as eating them, but we don't know what the original impetus for farming them was. Uh, the capes and headdresses that you see here include exotic feathers from things beside turkey. Uh, they include uh, parrots and hummingbirds and things like that. But the cape that you see in the corner here is pure turkey feathers. And it shows you the iridescent colors that come as a result of the structural color that the, the feathers have. Also common in the, uh, the Mexican and Aztec lineage is this particular turkey deity, Chalchiototlan. Chalchiototlan was the plague god of, of uh, their calendar year. And it was quite a terrible god, uh, very powerful. I think it looks more like a hawk, frankly, if you look at the feet uh, and the bill. But if you look at this appendage here, the snood, and this appendage here, the wattle, and the, and the tail and the, and the wings, it's clearly a turkey. We also know that turkeys were given, uh, in golden images of turkeys, were given to, Mont uh, to Hernan Cortez by Montezuma as a, as a gift. And you can see a replica of one of those golden turkey things with the, the snood on the turkey and the wings and tail. Now, New England's turkey history really dates way back to the Pilgrim times. So in the 1500s, turkeys were so common, you could practically go out and, and shoot them, you could probably grab them. Uh, and those turkeys made their way to Europe and were farm raised and they became, by 1573, they became the, the common Christmas dinner in England was turkey. However, because everybody hunted them and they were so easy to hunt because of their relative numbers, by 16, 72, there were virtually no turkeys. Uh, it was really hard to meet them. Very rare, in fact. And by 1851, there were no turkeys at all in Massachusetts. Uh, one of the diarists of the time said that de deliciousness killed them. Fast forward a couple of years to the Civil War and there were no turkeys in all of New England. They were totally extirpated. So then what happened? By the 1920s, turkeys were totally gone from 18 of the 39 states of their ancestral range, totally extirpated. We had eaten them and hunted them to death. But then hunters got wise and they said, we gotta bring them back. And they lobbied, there was a very strong hunting lobby early on there, very responsible hunting lobby. And they passed the Pittman-Robertson Act in 37 that authorized all sorts of money to restore wild turkeys. And this restoration wasn't particularly easy. They started trying to put domesticated turkeys out there and they were just <laughs> dumber than dirt and they, they just could not survive on their own. So then they introduced wild turkeys from other regions around the US and that proved more successful. They used these uh, nets that were shot out of cannons to capture the turkeys. Their efforts were so successful that by 1973, you had almost a million three turkeys in the area. Now, I wanna do two polls right now. The first one I wanna do is how many of you have actually seen a turkey? So let me 
do a little poll here. We'll or organize a poll. Have you ever seen a turkey? If you've ever seen a turkey, I want you to answer yes. If you've never seen one in your yard, in your own yard now, not somebody else's yard, answer no. My goodness. It looks as though almost everybody, only one out of 54 people on this uh, webinar, have failed to see a, see a turkey. So they're pretty darn common. Now, the next poll that I'm going to run is, how many turkeys have you seen? Uh, the largest number of turkeys that you've seen in your yard now, not somebody else, at a single time. The largest number at a single time. Don't give me a running count, just the largest number at a single time. It looks as though six to ten turkeys are the, the sort of median number of turkeys people see at a given time in their yard. And this, this is a reasonable flock. But I'm amazed at the number of people. Six people have seen more than 20 turkeys at a time in their yard. And that's, uh, that's quite amazing. We know that in 73 they started to proper, to pro prosper, and that's because the National Wild Turkey Federation was formed as a 501c3, a very effective nonprofit lobbyist, primarily formed by hunters and people who wanted to conserve the breed. And then the population exploded. By 2001, you had two over two and a half million hunters pursuing over five and a half million turkeys. They were all over the place. And by 2009, you had eight million turkeys and people engaging in the blame game, blaming the turkeys for everything, for eating the blueberry crops in Maine, for eating the grapes in the vineyards and from New York to California. By the way, it was really foxes, deers, raccoons, things like that, not the turkeys. The turkeys were eating the bugs. They were blamed in Montana for ruining the hay left for overwinning cattle because their droppings would get on the hay. And of course, they were blamed for attacking people, shiny car doors, and the windows of houses in the suburbs. But now the turkey population is dropping. It's dropped some 18% between 2014 to 2018. We have only about six and a half million birds uh, in the US, that's the estimate right now. So it's, it's dropped quite a bit. And the culprit seems to be climate change, uh, especially in the South, because turkeys breed based on daylight, uh, the amount of daylight. And leaf out and insect hatch is happening before turkeys are getting the cue to breed. And that means that the poults, the young turkeys, don't have the rich source of insects to eat to fatten up. So you've got habitat loss, climate change, uh, really affecting the turkey population. To give you a sense of what kinds of turkeys there are, there are at least five or six different breeds of turkey in the U.S. and uh, in Mexico and Central America. We have our eastern turkeys in blue here. That's the ones, those are the ones that we commonly see. There's a Florida turkey. There's a Miriam's, uh, there's a Mir Miriam's turkey which is uh, in the mountain states. And then there's the Rio Grande turkey that has been exported to California and to Hawaii. And their Californians, uh, the, the hunters lobbied very strongly to get turkeys in California. And they were placed there, but there is no evidence that they actually existed there to begin with. So there are turkeys everywhere and there are different breeds of turkey and they look different. So if you look at, and I apologize for the slightly out of focus picture uh, of the Colorado or Merriam's turkey uh, on, the, on the left, I wasn't good at focusing at that point. But the main difference is in the coloration of the, t the feathers in the tail. That's the main difference. You'll see in our New England turkeys, that's a rich, rich, rusty red brown color. Both of them have a buff uh, edge to the fanned tail, but it's a lighter color in the uh, mountain or Miriam's uh, turkey. 
and the rough here, it's a double rough, is very, very light. And this is what a gobbler sounds like when they're displaying like this. So turkeys we know are big birds. They're, they're quite hefty, but the only bird that's larger than a wild turkey in North America is the trumpeter swan. Uh, pound for pound, it's, it's larger than a turkey. Uh, on average, our wild turkeys uh, go from eight to 10 for a female to up to 24 for a male. Whereas a trumpeter will start at 17 pounds, uh, averaging out about 28 pounds. Trumpeters are also larger in the wingspan. They've got a six and a half foot wingspan and a lifespan of almost 24 years. Turkeys, on the other hand, have about a three to five foot wingspan. And we really don't know their lifespan. We think it's three to four years based on hunters' accounts of birds, but because the birds aren't banded and recorded, we don't have the records. Uh, I've talked to wildlife veterinarians and they think based on the size of the bird uh, as it becomes an adult, that it probably could live to 12 to 24 years, just like a swan. So let's look at the records for wild turkeys. Males run about 16 to 24 pounds, and you're looking at a male turkey right now in the Newton Cemetery. Females, eight to 10 pounds. The largest wild turkey shot, according to the uh, National Wild Turkey Federation, was 37 pounds. That's a big turkey. These birds stand at least four feet tall when you encounter them, uh, and aggressive ones feel like they're a lot taller than that. Uh, and as we said, their wingspan is five to six feet. So what do you call them? Males are called toms or gobblers. The females are called hens. Young turkeys have two different names, uh, actually three. Any young turkey is called a poult. If it's a female turkey, young turkey, it's called a jenny. If it's a young male turkey, it's called a jake. So your poults can come as either jennies or jakes. And a whole group of turkeys can be called a flock, but they can also be called a crop, a dole, a posse, or a raffle. I like a posse because especially when the uh, males are dispersing uh, and being solitary and start establishing pecking order and attacking you, it does feel like they're a posse. All of those things that hang off of a turkey have names. This pointed thing on the between the eye and the, and the bill at the front of the forehead is called a snood. And it can be engorged with blood and hang down over the, uh, the bill. This red appendage here is called a waddle, sometimes called a dewlap, and it flops around like my old waddle. And then there are these big growths called caruncles. If it's a male turkey, it will have a beard, and the beard comes out of the center of the chest here and they can be quite lush. And if it's a male turkey, you will see something called a spur on the turkey's foot. And the spur can be small as it is on this small, uh, maybe year, two year old turkey foot. And you can see by the foot, it's quite, quite a large foot. Uh, they can be small or they can get up to two and a half inches. So another, this is a, fur, a turkey, a male turkey in full display. You'll see how the snood drapes over the, uh, the bill. And you can see how the major caruncle, uh, caruncles are really engorged with, with blood. But you'll also see the red, white, and blue head. This is amazing. It's almost an electric blue color on the head uh, and red, and then the white right at the quack crest. Snoods, just for your information, are in fact real things. They were uh, an ornamental hairnet or a fabric bag worn over a lady's hair. About that, bur uh, that beard, those are actually feathers. Uh, they're about mm, nine inches on average for an adult. Uh, and they have, they feel like uh, coat thread, uh, the old button thread you used for coats and buttons. 
but they're, they don't have spines that go out on the, on the turkey feather. They're just a long, thin strand, but it is actually a feather. The longest beard recorded by the National Wild Turkey Federation uh, was in 2007 on a, a, a bird that had been taken. It was 22 and a half inches long. Now, nationally, about 10 to 20 percent of the hens have beards but only one to two percent in Massachusetts. So if you see a bird with a beard like that, with the uh, snood and with caruncles and quite a colorful head, that's going to be a male turkey. A word about turkey tails. If it's a young turkey, these middle feathers will stick out above the rest of the fanned tail. That's for the jakes. The adult toms have a totally continuous line of feathers. And those feathers are about 12 to 15 inches long. They have banded tips. This is what one looks like. And you can see the tip at the edge uh, and the, the striping on the feathers. They create quite a, a lift for the bird if it's, if it's jumping up and flying. There are five to 6,000 feathers on a wild turkey. And they're iridescent. You can see the copper colors that show up, the greens, uh, and the, the golds that show up on them. Those iridescent bronzes are for display. And when the bird fluffs up, you see the black feathers, because most of the feathers are black, contrasted with those iridescent feathers to quite a good advantage. Females, on the other hand, are drab and brown or gray, and they use that for camouflaging on the nest. So here you see a turkey, a female turkey in flight. All of those feathers look like old dead leaves, and that's important because if they don't, that turkey is in real danger. She's going to spend about a month, 28 days, on a nest, and it's a ground nest, so her camouflage is very, very important. So what do we mean by structural color? Structural color is, uh, is the actual feather's uh, surface, and it has little ridges uh, called lenticles, and those lenticles reflect color of different wavelengths depending on how the light hits them. So if the feather is flat, you, it may look just black, but if the light is hitting it in a certain way, You'll see purples and blues and bronzes uh, and all sorts of gorgeous colors, especially these, these yummy colors. And turkeys have to take care of those feathers. They do that by dusting, which is, you can see here in the bottom, this turkey, dusting, anting, picking up ants and putting them, rubbing them for their folic acid around their feathers, preening. And this is what it looks like when those turkeys are dusting. These are poults dusting at the Newton Cemetery. It's a mixed flock. Two hens have merged their poults. And you can see the bolts on the, on the ground here trying to dig up the mulch and, and fluff up their feathers and dust themselves off. They, they're learning that behavior while the adults watch. I showed you a picture of a foot before, and if you were to look at the bottom of that foot, you'll see the length of those toenails. Those toenails are what the animal uses to rototill, literally rototill the earth, looking for grubs and looking for other kinds of insects. The spurs, and you can see how long this one is, uh, and these, those spurs are used for fighting. They're large, bony uh, outgrowths on the male's legs, only the male's legs. Uh, and those legs are very strong. Wild turkeys can fly at almost up to 55 miles an hour. And they can certainly run if they have to. Usually they'd prefer to jump and fly out of the way. But they can run up to, 55, uh, up to 25 miles an hour. 
Where do you find them? The ideal habitat has two things, both open and forested ground, open, far, open fields and uh, lawns and things where they can find eat insects very easily, forested areas where they can roost and get out of harm's way. Here are wild turkeys flying up to roost in the Newton Cemetery at about 4.30. And when they do this, the hen will do an assembly call that sounds like this. That yelping sound is the hen's call to, okay, everybody, assemble, fly up in the trees. And they do, they all fly up there and they make a racket flying up there. So here we have quite a number of turkeys. There are over 12, you can see them all perched on the branches. There's one here, 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 here. One up there, 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 there. There's a big one here, there's one down here. There are a couple over here and a couple over here. When they're flying up, I don't know what causes this sound, but this sounds like somebody bashing sticks against each other. And I don't know whether that's the turkey's wings and their very stiff feathers, whether it's the turkey's wings hitting branches or, or something else, but they make a racket uh, with, and not by calling, just by, by somehow touching things. You can find where they're commonly roosting by finding their feathers on the ground or by finding their scat droppings right here on the ground. Those are their favorite roosting places. And the feathers are there because turkeys do not molt all their feathers at once the way uh, wild waterfowl do. Uh, they cannot afford to be flightless because their protection is up in trees, getting up in the trees and, and hiding up there uh, overnight. They eat quite a few things. I was just charmed by this picture, so I had to include it. This, uh, my cousin took this at a, school's, uh, at a schoolyard out in Acton. It looks like the turkey's ready to be served to dinner instead of being dinner for somebody. Uh, but their, their diet changes based on the time of year. So in the late spring, uh, when the poults are out, uh, they're looking for the seeds of seeds and grasses, and sedges, they'll just strip the seeds right off of them, off of ferns. They're looking for insects, they'll eat small salamanders and snakes, they'll eat snails, uh, they, they like the protein. In the fall, over winter, they're looking for acorns, uh, American beech nuts, hickory nuts, black cherries, white ash seeds, uh, birch catkins, all sorts of seeds and berries and buds and you will see them commonly looking in somebody's garden. This is my neighbor's raised garden beds, and these turkeys are stripping all of the buds off of her kale plants. These turkeys are running around my backyard, rototilling my backyard, I might add, uh, and you can see the little divots where they've been looking for good stuff. They're making two sounds when they're out there. These little sounds called clucks. That's to get attention from somebody else in their flock. But if there's a danger around and they want to get attention for danger, they make a putting sound and it's a piercing putt. As I said, they will go up into trees to eat. And here you have a, a hen turkey stripping berries uh, off of a tree in winter. So life in a year of a turkey is, is really about staying alive and breeding. In the fall, right about now, the flocks are breaking up into uh, sex-related groups. So the adult and juvenile hens will fall together in a group. And this is when you start seeing 20 and 30 turkeys at once. It'll be a mixture of adult hens merging their poult uh, flocks together. You'll also see adult male turkeys in, uh, in flocks, but they'll separate from the juvenile gobblers, smaller flocks, threes and fours. 
there was a gang of three at the Newton Cemetery that used to attack everybody, and they have since used dogs to chase them away. During the winter, turkeys are just trying to stay alive. They can live uh, in, through winter here, but they've got to forage for survival, and they're also exercising, especially these adult and juvenile gobblers, they're exercising uh, their prowess at establishing dominance over other birds. During the spring, we're talking now March and on, they're breeding. So this is when you're going to hear turkeys a lot. This is when you hear the gobbling and the yelping. They'll be nesting and they'll be hatching and brooding their nests. In the summer, that's when the insects should be at their peak. They'll be trying to grow those poults, keeping them uh, as well fed as possible. And the gobblers will totally leave the hens alone. Breeding is done. So overwintering, as long as there's no more than about six inches of snow on the ground, turkeys can scratch through the snow and, and find food. But if there's more than six inches, turkeys can, if they're well fed, survive for up to two weeks just living off the fat of their own bodies before they become really endangered. They will frequent your feeder. They won't compete with the coyotes, uh, but they will frequent your feeders uh, looking for seed. And by the time spring walks around, you've got the courting season beginning. And I love this photo from Mary Holland, who does the Naturally Curious blog, where she shows uh, several, at least two, adult males and one Jake. You can see by the feathers being longer in the middle displaying and trying to catch the attention of this hen. Once the turkey mates, she will start laying eggs. Uh, she lays about an egg a day and starts to brood them. Uh, she'll lay up to 17 eggs. Usually it's 10 to 12. It's a ground nest. Mostly she just scratches a hole or depression in the ground. She doesn't line it with anything. Maybe some feathers fall off of her body, but that's about it. And she sits on that to incubate it for 28 days on average. Now here's the problem. If she's not well camouflaged, anything can get her and those eggs. But her camouflage is so good that I've watched dogs pass within six feet of a turkey going nuts, dogs on leashes, going nuts because they can smell the turkey, but they can't see it. So their camouflage is quite good. Now the problem with the population is that only about half of these nests that turkeys lay and brood survive to hatching. Only about half. And that's because you have a pile of egg predators running around and those, easy, those eggs are easy to get when mom is off the nest and trying to forage for her own food. This is not a, uh, she is not uh, helped by the male turkey at all. So if she gets off the nest to eat, blue jays, crows, skunks, raccoons, foxes, coyotes, everything will eat her eggs, including snakes. If the poult lives beyond the first two weeks, it's got a better chance of survival. But it's most vulnerable in those first two weeks. Uh, they leave the nest on hatching. I mean, they're, they're born totally awake with their eyes open, lots of fluffy down, uh, and they aren't able to fly until like the second or the third day of their life. But then they can actually get up and roost and get out of the way. But here's the problem. Only about 7% of the nests produce, ne uh, produce poults that survive their very first month. So you're talking a real terrible numbers game here. The mothers do protect their poults. Uh, Rick Olick took this marvelous picture. He was trying to figure out what the turkey was doing, and it wasn't until he looked at the, the, the picture that he could figure it out. And he figured it out by noticing these little tiny feet sticking out from underneath her wings and breast feathers. Whenever a hawk would fly over or a coyote would menace or anything like this, the bird just covers the poults. There are turkey predators, not just for the poults, but also for the adults. Uh, poults are taken by all sorts of hawks and owls, coyotes and foxes. The adults are mostly taken by humans. 
bobcats, coyotes, fishers. Fishers will take poults as well. We talked a little bit uh, when I first started about pecking order and social dominance. And, and turkeys are social birds. They gather in flocks and they can recognize each other. They can recognize 200, 300 individual uh, turkeys or people. They can recognize people as well as they can recognize uh, and distinguish between turkeys. I'm going to play you a video because it's a video of toms establishing dominance. They're establishing pecking order. You can see them circling this little tree. It looks like they're playing ring around the rosy, right? These are turkeys playing, right? No, these are turkeys establishing dominance. Now, the question is, who's the dominant turkey? The first one to leave or the last one to leave? It turns out that it's the last one to leave. The first, it's like the first one to blink is the lowest on the rung of dominance. Their fights, these, the turkey cocks, the, the, the toms, uh, can be quite violent and often bloody. They lock beaks, they lock necks, and they tussle back and forth. This is a wonderful sequence of pictures uh, taken by two fighting turkey cocks on the plains in Oklahoma with a third one refereeing. It was hysterical. This is the third bird watching as this bird jumps and tries to rake with his spurs uh, the other bird that he's fighting with. They've locked their beaks and necks here. They did this for 15 minutes before this turkey was driven away. They don't just attack other turkeys, they attack humans. They attack shiny doors, they attack all sorts of things. Uh, this woman made the Boston Globe with bruises all over her thigh. Uh, and it's, it's a serious problem. Turkeys can be quite aggressive. So what do you do with an aggressive turkey? Uh, I learned the high, hard way what not to do. Uh, I had watched this gang of three um, adult turkeys, uh, toms, prowling around and attacking a shiny door of a gentleman's car in the Newton Cemetery. They're attacking that door because they see their reflection and they've never seen themselves, so that's a new turkey that they have to establish dominance over. That's why they peck at the windows, that's why they peck at the doors. But in this case, they were chasing the guy all around his car. He had to go into the opposite passenger side before he could get in. So we decided, we, I was walking with, my, with a friend and with my sister and her boyfriend, and we decided we'd pick up large sticks in case we had to fend off these turkeys. And sure enough, we were free of turkeys through the entire walk until the very end. Now, I didn't tell you, I was wearing a bright red jacket, just like a red coat, right? I was wearing a bright red jacket, and for some reason I turned around, and this turkey, just like the one you see in this picture, was making a beeline for me, right behind my back. He was going to peck me. And I dragged out my stick, and I crouched down, and I tried to fend him off like a fencer. And he kept on darting his head in between this stick, and this was a substantial stick. And I finally ended up whacking him on the side of the head, and it just made him start to jump up in the air, and now he was going to try to attack me with these spurs. And I was really worried, so I called for my sister, and my sister started to run up. So I thought, safety in numbers, right? My sister starts to run up, and her friend, her boyfriend, comes up and says, don't do anything, I want a picture. <laughs> well, we didn't listen to him. We both, she put her hands up over her head and ran at the turkey. Don't ever make yourself small. Don't ever crouch down. Make yourself big. Put your hands up, yell and scream. The turkey will run off. If you have a very large umbrella, open the umbrella and wave it at the turkey. That will, will help as well. Or you might decide to eat the turkeys. Now this, is, this was uh, done in jest. We're not clearly not going to eat the turkeys because you can't hunt turkeys in the city uh, session. But I want to run another poll here. And this poll is going to be if you've ever hunted a turkey. So I'm going to share the results uh, <laughs> that people have hunted uh, a turkey. 
And there are people who are saying, yeah, they'd hunt a turkey in the future. <laughs> and the turkey parts that I've been displaying were taken by a hunter in New Hampshire who was kind enough to give me the uh, foot for display. So how do you hunt turkeys? Turkeys are big game. They're the second most sought after game after deer. And about 21% of the hunters that hunt pursue turkeys. And Alaska is the only state that doesn't permit hunting. If you look at the turkeys bagged, it's a big, big business. These are the number of turkeys bagged in various areas and the size uh, of them as well. So the number of birds recorded, 200 plus in various counties in Florida, which is really good habitat uh, for them. And you see smaller numbers around the rest of the US. But you also see size differences. Uh, our Massachusetts wild turkey records you can see they're, a lot, they're on the Cape, they're out, but if you get out into the western part of the state, you'll see more birds. Again, it's habitat issue. Uh, the top score for the two birds that are records were uh, 21 pounds, almost 22 pounds, and uh, a score that includes scores on spurs and, beak and beards and things like that of uh, 69 points. When can you hunt those wild turkeys in Massachusetts? Well, you've missed the spring season. It's the last week in April. It has uh, some very interesting wording. Uh, but the fall hunting season depends on what zone you are, where you're, where you're hunting. Uh, the zone in west of 495 uh, is essentially uh, a couple of weeks uh, in mid-October uh, for actual gun hunting. But you have uh, archery hunting uh, into November. So if you're a bow and arrow user, you've got a longer hunting season. East of 495, our country, the Cape and the Islands, has a couple of weeks at the beginning of October and then through uh, November for archery equipment only. And from October 16, we've already missed that season, October 16 to 28, uh, for any kind of gun hunting. The limits vary by spring and fall. In spring, you're allowed to take two gobblers, bearded birds, uh, the, the male birds. And in the fall, you're allowed to take either a tom or a hen, but only one bird. What are you gonna do if you wanna hunt them? You've gotta look for tracks and signs, figure out where they are, then go camp out there really early in the morning before the light comes up and use camo because turkeys are wily and they can see you and they can hear you from really far away. You'll notice where they are by looking at their tracks. If there's been snow or if there's dust, you'll see a very distinct three large toes and one heel toe with a toe drag. Or you can look for scat. Uh, these are supposedly turkey scat from the National Wild Turkey Federation. Uh, and the scats are straight or J-shaped for, for gobblers, if you're after gobbler, uh, or sort of spiral or curlicue for hens. And they're somewhat narrower than, than goose scat. You've seen goose scat everywhere. Uh, you can also look for torn up areas, areas that look like they've been rototilled. That's where these incredible feet of theirs come into play, digging up the earth. Uh, let's see, I think we've heard all of these calls. So again, here's the gobbler. Here's the cluck to get attention. Here's the purr, I'm a contented character. They do sound like a herd of cats in, in your backyard if you ever heard them doing that. Here's the alarm call. And here's the hen's call to assemble and go up to room. With that, I'm going to end it and uh, we'll take questions. Terrific. Thank you so much, Barbara. That was a wonderful visit with turkeys. I especially like that two-week-old poult that you showed. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that was just little guys. gorgeous. Yes.
So let us go to questions. Uh, you started out early by asking us how many people had seen groupings. And we have a question from Robert saying, I have witnessed exponential yearly increases in the size of a single flock of turkeys on West Newton Hill until the flock numbered about 30. I assume this must entail some inbreeding. If so, are these birds somehow held harmless from common effects of inbreeding? Well, I don't know about that necessarily being inbreeding because when a flock gets that large, it's a number of turkeys who have pooled their poults, a number of hens that have pooled their poults, and those hens may have bred with other uh, toms. So it doesn't necessarily mean inbreeding. Uh, I suspect that they're on West Newton Hill and they're congregating there because there are really good oak trees and lots of acorns and lots of good roosting spaces. So that's prime habitat. Yeah, maybe it's prime real estate too. You got million dollar houses up there, but as far as the turkeys are concerned, you got million dollar trees up there too. Terrific. Thank you. Now, I didn't know before what you told us about how when they tried to reestablish the wild turkeys, uh, that they had to bring in turkeys from other regions. So are those, are our current turkeys now different than the turkeys that were originally here? Do we know? I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't know that anybody knows that. Uh, they're differently, clearly different breeds. You've got the Eastern breed, the mountain breed, the, the Mexican breeds. Uh, so I, I really don't know the answer to that. There are different breeds now. Uh, were they back in the 1500s the same as they are now? I don't know. Oh, we need a, someone like Thoreau from back there who yes. kept all sorts of notes. Oh, well. Uh, we have a question of saying, can you elaborate more on anting? I have never heard of it, and it sounds very interesting. Uh, well, you're more likely to see anting with uh, with blue jays and crows than, than with turkeys, just because they're more common uh, and more easily uh, examined. But what the animal will do is it'll pick up an ant and rub it all over itself rub it on their feathers, uh, and it's the formic acid, we think, that's in the ant that it's getting some benefit from. I may then eat the ant, for all I know. Maybe it's an extra meal, too. <laughs> you know? Hand lotion and, and a snack. <laughs> What's left of it, right? <laughs> right. Neat. Uh, Pamela says that she is a video of a turkey running away with one of her prized tomatoes. She said she didn't see veggies on your list other than kale. So yes, any veggie, any berry, any <laughs> anything they can get that beak around. <laughs> I would imagine cherry tomatoes would be just wonderful. <laughs> Neat. So you talked about the jakes having the longer center ridge. Do we know why? It must be the rate at which these feathers grow. Uh, I, I don't know why. Uh, I can't tell you authoritatively why that would be. Okay. Uh, you just got me thinking so many interesting ways. Now, you said that the hens call when they go up into the trees. Are Is that because at that point they're all female and poults, or are they sort of the, the head of the, the flock? It's because they're the head of the female flock. Okay, okay. Uh, the the jakes, uh, the toms, they're all separate. They're all doing their own thing in much smaller flocks. Uh, oh. I've never seen more than three. Uh, this doesn't mean there aren't more. I've never seen more than three toms at once in a flock. Fascinating. Uh we have a question from Susie asking, how far can they fly? Well, they can fly up to a mile. Uh, they prefer to uh, to jump up into a tree if they can. So if there's no tree around, they'll they'll fly for a mile. They're they're not migrating birds, so they don't they're not long distance flyers. Okay. But they will. Do they? 
stay very much in one neighborhood or do they fly to, to the West Newton Hill birds come and hang out at Crystal Lake or did they tend to stay in their little subregions? They go where the food is, the food in the roosting area. And they don't usually fly, they walk, as anybody who's tried to drive down Walnut Street or <laughs> Commonwealth Avenue or Lowell or any of those streets, uh, there's the turkey procession across the street. <laughs> uh, Neat. Now, a lot of your photos uh, were taken from the cemetery. Is that where you recommend we go if we want to do some uh, turkey spotting? Not anymore, sadly. Uh, the, the cemetery has uh, used the dogs, the uh, border collies and uh, herding dogs that get rid of the geese to now get rid of the turkeys that were attacking people. So I have rarely seen turkeys in the cemetery. Now the population has also declined. I used to have turkeys every year in my backyard. I haven't seen a single turkey this year in my backyard. Wow. Does that mean we shouldn't be hunting them? Uh, I don't think so, not yet. Uh, you'll, uh, you'll notice on the slide that about uh, mass hunting regulations, those regulations change every year. Okay. Uh, I believe the bag limits will change if they need to preserve the population. National Wild Turkey Federation has a very strong lobbying group to preserve uh, habitat, uh, just the way the, the waterfowl hunters uh, got duck stamps and things like that to preserve uh, waterfowl habitat. Uh, they've, they've got quite a strong lobby to uh, help with conservation of these birds so they can go out and shoot them. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so you're going to have a, a balancing act. Okay. Susie and I both clearly are interested in getting in the brains of these turkeys, trying to figure out what's going on. And so we're going to let Susie go first. Uh, she says, sometimes it seems that they are holding up traffic traffic on purpose. Thoughts? <laughs> Uh, no, I think they're trying to figure out their pecking order with your car. So, and if your car looks intimidating enough, they'll get out of the way. <laughs> okay, they're my question. To, they're also trying to keep their flock together. Okay, okay. Uh, my question is, I know how they did tests with Blue Jays to figure out how they recognize people. How did they know the turkeys recognize people and how many? I don't know that they've done tests to establish how many different people they can recognize. But we do know from uh, anecdotal accounts of people who've tracked, there's a, there's a fellow who uh, wrote a book, I've forgotten what it's called now, and he did a video for PBS uh, about living for a year with a flock of turkeys in uh, the flatlands of, I think it was Florida. Uh, and he talks about the bird's ability. The birds have incredibly keen eyesight. Uh, the bird's ability to find snakes and dangerous things that he thought as a woodsman he would spot, and he was ready to step on them. They could see it. Uh, but they can identify different people, and if you've established dominance over them, they will leave you alone, and if you haven't, they will attempt to establish dominance over you. So uh, I don't know the exact numbers. It would be wonderful if somebody could do some research, but again, um, they're wild birds and it's hard, to, it's hard to do that research. There doesn't seem to be any incentive. How oh, neat. Well, we go from the intelligence of the birds to the intelligence of people. Uh, we have a question. I cross the street whenever I see the Auburndale flock in front of me. My husband walks right up to them. Who is smarter? <laughs> Well, that would depend on your husband's experience after he walks right <laughs> up to them. <laughs> if if, uh, if your husband has, has established dominance, he's home free. If you haven't, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to figure out whether the turkeys know you. If they know you and they think they're dominant over you, be prepared to be pecked. <laughs> well, they will peck us, and now we've got questions about us pecking them. Uh, we have two I'm going to present together. And one is, can you eat wild turkeys? And the second one is, how does wild turkey meat compare to domesticated turkey meat? 
Yes, you can definitely eat wild turkeys. And if they've been feeding on acorns, you're going to have a nice fat bird. Uh, that's what all those hunters are after. They're not just after feathers and feet. Uh, now, most of the hunters will take merely the, the, the heavy breast and legs and dispense with the rest of the animal, which is sort of sad. But you can roast it, you can braise it. Uh, I personally have never eaten roast turkey. Uh, the fellow who gave me the legs would not share the meat. <laughs> he liked it too much. So uh, I suspect it's quite nice. But you can see this foot uh, has quite a good ability to rototill the earth. I just wanted to show that in, where it was a larger image for people to see. Well, we have a question about that rototilling. Uh, someone says, well, they dig up lawns for grubs. I've never seen them dig up lawns. That's probably skunks. But they will rototill your mulch all the time. And that's part of the reason that the cemetery, I think, has gone after uh, getting the, do the dogs out there to keep them from rototilling their mulch and flower, be flower beds. Well, we do have a dog question. Hold on. I have to. Here we go. Uh, the turkeys in my neighborhood, Wobbin, are quite leery of my 45-pound dog, a hound terrier mix on walks. Clearly, they see him as a predator, even when he doesn't chase them. Do they ever charge dogs the way they charge people? I have never heard of them ever charging dogs, but I don't know that they couldn't. <laughs> Oh, we've got so many things for research. We've got to get a <laughs> research team. Um, someone asks, this summer I saw a lone poult wandering around and clucking for at least 20 minutes. Do hens often lose track of their poults? No, they don't usually lose track of their poults. Uh, 20 minutes is a long time to be separated from a flock. Uh, and unless the flock was hidden from the viewer and they, the, the hen was going to come out and reunite with the, with the poult, I would assume that the poult had, had been abandoned either by a car hitting the, 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 the hen or something else, or predation by coyotes or uh, foxes or fishers, something like that. In an urban area, relatively urban like Newton, where are the turkey nests? Are they in places like Webster Woods and the cemetery before the dogs? <laughs> well, that may be why we're not seeing so many. Yes, they would be in field-like areas, uh, field and forest edges, Cold Spring, Webster Woods, the larger conservation areas, possibly the, the rough patches of, of golf courses. Okay. I wonder if they're in Nahantan. We'll have to ask some of the Nahantan folks. I would guess they would be. That's good. It seems like it would be a good area. And maybe when we're talking about conservation there, it would be worth talking about that. Neat. Okay, we've got some more questions here. Uh, how do the Toms fight? The Toms fight uh, a number of ways. They will uh, bump each other. And then they'll start to, to lock their necks like this. So let's see if I can do that with my hands, like this. And they'll wrestle back and forth. Uh, they'll, they'll beak lock, so they'll grab each other's beaks and rapple, rapple around like that. Then they'll separate and jump in the air and try to use these, these, these spurs to rake each other. So the, the animal will jump in the air and try to rake the other. With its uh, and they'll they'll throw feathers off and things like that. That's how they fight. So what is the prize that they win? The prize is dominance. I'm over you in the pecking order. You're subservient to me. Okay. So if the males, right. if the males and females don't hang out together that much then is it is that dominance valuable for breeding still for when absolutely because in the spring they've already established that dominance and when they start to display they'll get the the attention from the hens 
Now, I say they'll get the attention from the hens. Before the turkeys disappeared from the, the cemetery, you would see a, a turkey, a, a tom turkey, a, a turkey cock out there, you know, the fan is all puffed up. And they do. They puff themselves up, make themselves look four times the size of their normal size. They fluff up all their feathers, and they drag their, their wings on the ground, uh, again, to look large. And when they do that, the hens will just be going, <laughs> it can be quite comical. Uh, eventually, they will come around. OK. Do they, do they have territories? When you say that they hang out in like groups of three, do the three of them share a territory? Do they try to establish their own territories? Or is territory not a thing with turkeys? I don't know that territory is a thing. Okay. Uh, I've never read about it uh, anywhere. I haven't witnessed it. They, again, are going where the food is. OK. OK. OK, we've got two uh, open-ended questions that I think are very good ways to come to the ends of our questions. Uh, one is, what can be done to help turkeys? What can be done to help turkeys? That's a good one. Uh, habitat restoration, I think, is the primary one. Uh, and whatever you can do to stop global warming and climate change. I would say those would be the two big things. Uh, keep your dogs on leashes, because dogs running amok are just going to add to the uh, the, the uh, pressure on nesting turkeys, especially in the spring. So I know it's tempting. Everybody does it. Their dogs are off leash in Webster Woods. Their dogs are off leash in Cold Spring Parks. Their dogs are off leash in Manhattan. You know, <laughs> not, not you, not you, <laughs> not everybody. Uh, but uh, those would be the kinds of things. If you want to donate money for habitat restoration, there are organizations like the National Wild Turkey Federation that you can donate to. Uh, that would be the way, yeah. And what inspired your interest in research of turkeys? Well, my interest started when I started encountering them so much in, in the cemetery. And I got really curious about these birds because they're big animals. Uh, and when I got attacked by one and we were starting to read all about this in the newspaper, I'm very interested in, in uh, the sort of the love-hate relationship we have with various big animals in our environment. And turkeys are one of those archetypal love them, hate them kinds of animals. Uh, so I just started to read and research. And at the time, I was still working for Mass Audubon. And uh, I was asked by Brookhaven to make some presentations. So I thought, I'll do turkeys. <laughs> That's neat. Yeah, we should have a poll sometime about which do you dislike more? Turk I got turkeys, geese, and coyotes. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's deer, geese. And <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. We just don't have as many areas with deer here, but yes, completely. Okay, we have one more specific question. You talked to us and said that turkeys in general can't fly far. Uh but the question is, do they do short distances over and over to get to a nesting site? Or do they just do as you told us and walk the whole way? Well, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. I assume, this is an assumption, that they walk because they can, they're fast runners. They're 25 miles an hour. You know, they can do a fast dart or jump up into a tree to escape their predator. So why spend the energy flying if you could walk? and get bugs to eat on the way. Uh, that's my logic behind that. I, I don't think that they're long distance flyers uh, from everything I've read. Even in short hops, do they have races? Now that's a way to establish <laughs> dominance, right? Um, this was amazing. This was just terrific, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you very much for letting us see a little bit of the life of turkeys. Um, thank you, everyone for uh we, we're getting thanks in the q a here uh thank you for joining us if you have more questions for barbara you may submit them to her through webinars at newtonconservators.org and i guarantee they'll all get to her 
Uh, we thank you for joining us for this fall season. We will be back with many more fascinating nature topics in the spring. We're working on them right now. Thank you so much, Barbara. Good night, everyone. 